Yes, I'm still here, Hollywood. And coming up on today's episode... I'm like, I know how to ride a horse, like, side saddle, and you'll be wearing a chastity belt. I'm like, it's a what and a huh? And I have had a, a crush on her. And I don't like when you go, a girl crush, a boy crush, crush. Mel said, hold on, did you just genuflect to my wife? He's like, stop talking to the extras and concentrate. I'm like, but they're my friends. <laughs> Actors come to Hollywood from all over the world to take their shot at being a star. Some say that acting is their calling. But once in a while, life events can change that focus from acting to something more important than stardom. Today, I'm talking to an actor who's been in some of the most popular movies and TV shows of our time. The Mask, Pretty Woman, Wings. Though now, she's working on the most critical role of her career, saving lives. This is Still Here Hollywood. I'm Steve Kometko. Join me with today's guest, Amy Yazbek. I even put makeup on my hands. Cool. They're a mess. They look fine. You, sure they do. They have makeup on them. You know what Dolly Parton does? What? She has these beautiful kind of mesh gloves, like skin colored gloves that have nails on them. Smart, right? Yeah. Listen, everything you ever wanted to know about beauty, you can learn from a drag queen. And Dolly has done just that. God bless her. Can I have some money? And a lot of drag queens look up to her. Absolutely. How are you, Amy? You know, I'm good, considering all of the ways that the world knocks one down and challenges one. We know this. Well, and we're living in kind of a dark time, yeah, I think. I, I, I think so, to be able to be true to yourself sometimes without checking with what's cool or what's correct everybody knows for themselves what's correct for them and but in some ways it's a kinder time and in some ways it's a crueler time how did that happen i don't know i don't know i thought we were getting past all of that but i think the more i think a few oh, i hate to say this a few generations have to maybe live out their time that sounds terrible we have to learn as we go yes every generation Yes, but there are some people who are more amenable to learning about how others live their lives and not feeling threatened by it. Am I right? Right. Plus also how to put all your phone on uh, silent during a movie. I'm older generation. I'm learning stuff. I'll learn from anybody. Thanks for the vodka, by the way. You're welcome. No ice. Um, I really wanted to do a spit take in John's honor, but you look so nice. <laughs> Thank you. In 1989, Amy met her future husband, comic acting legend John Ritter, who was best known for the groundbreaking series Three's Company. They married a decade later in 1999, and in 2003, John died of what was later identified as an aortic dissection. You kind of stepped away from acting, didn't you? Not on purpose. I mean, I didn't, I didn't make a conscious effort to do it. I think I, I, I made choices when I would get an audition. I'm thinking, yes, but then I have that symposium and I'm meeting with that doctor and maybe they're going to talk. And I just started uh, like keep getting my eye off the ball, which was st stupid. But also, I mean, it was for a good cause. Do you think you stepped away too soon? Do you ever wish you hadn't stepped away quite so far? It was the time to do it. And of course, acting goes with everything. I mean, I, 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 I'm lucky, you know, I had enough money that I, for those times I couldn't work. Did lose my SAG insurance, though, during the pandemic. It happens. That sucks. I had breast cancer during that time. Totally fine, good now. But I, when people start talking about SAG and contracts and stuff, I'm like, oh, this really makes sense. Uh, uh, yes, I want to act again. <laughs> Jonathan Howard, my agent. Can you? Okay. You know Jonathan. I want to ask one thing about uh, Suzanne Summers. Yes. You got uh, John and Susan. We, she, we lost her not long ago. Yeah. You got the two of them kind of back together, didn't you? <laughs> that was so weird. In season five of Three's Company, there was a reported salary dispute between Suzanne Summers and the producers. It led to Summers leaving the series. 
It was kind of sneaky, wasn't it? I didn't do it a sneaky way. We were at the premiere of Victor Victoria on Broadway because Blake and Julie had invited John to it, dear friends. And at the intermission, um, I went to the ladies' room, and all of a sudden, Susanna is standing next to me. And I'm like, hi. I said, I'm Amy. I'm here with John Ritter. She's like, oh. I said, I'll make sure, or after party, she goes, well, I'm singing at the after party. I'm like, awesome, I'll make sure he says hi. And so then I, went, I went back to my seat and I said, for those who know, no, and I said, John, who's the last person you would want to see here? And he went, oh, it botch goes here? <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. I can't say any more than that. I went, no, Suzanne, and he just like sat down in the seat. He's like, okay. I don't know if he watched the rest of I mean, he watched the rest of the show, but I remember he was like, and I said, it's fine, just go up, because they had, you know, and so she sang a song, uh, Can't Dance, Don't Ask Me, and so I think he went up to her, and she was talking to somebody and said, um, Can't Dance, Don't Ask Me, and he like turned around and they hugged it out and stuff, which was great. Um, you know, it it was a big thing. And may I, say, may I say way before my time of like the real stuff that was going on with them. But I think they were great together and I don't think they ever maybe got each other, like where each other was coming from after that kind of split because John never felt that it was about a woman being paid, and John was like the most liberal and whatever. It was pretty even. I don't think, you know, and John wasn't able to, he didn't ever want to talk about it. Not a talker, want, huh? Didn't want to, no, he talk about it to me, but I mean, he didn't want to refute anything that Suzanne was saying or get into any kind of a, a weird thing. He just loved her, you know, and for a while from afar. So that, it was tricky, and I, it was sad when she passed, it was sad when John passed away, because that's then 20 years. Lost. Lost for like a friendship or any kind of furthering of a reunion, but she was great. She was a great, super strong woman and did a lot, you know, in also her own being a health advocate, right? So I, I I thought she was cool. And I met her a couple other times too. It was perfectly nice. Now I know Priscilla and Joyce very well. And Richard, who's hilarious. Richard, uh, Richard Klein, hilarious. Um, so I never really knew Suzanne very well, but I know like the, the rest of the cast. And um, God, I watched this, I just did a, a a rewatch podcast that this woman, Joss Richard, does. People are so still fascinated by that show. So interested, remembering it from their childhood, and then I watch so many with John, and then I'll just go, oh, yeah, he hit his head on that, so then he actually did pass out and slipped under the table, but then by the end, and they're like, wait, what? So that's kind of fun. John liked to tell those stories, and I like to tell those stories. Uh what was the best acting experience you ever had? I think, I was so stupid. Best, I mean, all, all of it. Of course, I loved working with John and I loved working with Mel Brooks. Men in Tights. Men in Tights and Men in Tights and Dracula Dead and Loving It. I do all, I do all the, I do all the weird things. But the most I ever felt like, oh, I'm, this is, I'm doing the thing. I'm just being me and I'm acting. <gasps> Was an episode of Street Justice with Carl Weathers. <laughs> this sounds so dumb, but it was a storyline of a young woman who has AIDS and is doesn't want to tell anybody because she doesn't want to be reminded of it and she just wants to live her life. This is so dumb. And if you look it up, maybe I'm horrible in it. But I just remember feeling, and Carl was great, you know, and I just remember, I don't know, like really feeling in touch with, because I had lost 
this was the 90s, right? Yes. We had lost so many people and agents and friends and acquaintances and people lost spouses and to AIDS that I kind of wanted to do like a really good job and don't, be, I don't know. This is so dumb, but I just, I thought about that recently. It's like, that's when I really felt like, oh, I'm doing it. I'm actually doing like, not a service, but like actual doing acting. Because a lot of times I feel like I'm just like a trained monkey that can do accents, which is fine. And people love that. I really do serve a comedy script very, very well. I do not have as much, in those days, I did not have as much confidence doing anything dramatic. Now I do because I'm trying not to cry all the time. It's like a whole different thing. What's your favorite accent? Oh, stop all of them, but I got a very, a compliment from the queen of accents. Meryl Streep? Okay, the other, the British queen of accents, Tracy Ullman. Oh, oh yes. Tracy was in Robin Hood Men in Tights with me, and I didn't know her. I had met, I, then I met her and my daughter-in-law, Melanie Linsky has worked with her, and so I, w I thought she was just like having me on, but she was like, where, I'm not doing the accents, which is, where did you come up with the Kensingtonian accent? I'm like, what is Kensingtonian? She's like, just the queen and just like four blocks around the, yeah, I'm so happy. Like that, and, and I went, isn't that how she talks? She goes, but do you think that's how everyone in England talks? She goes, I said, no, but a princess. She goes, yeah, <laughs> it's really camp. And it's like, oh, it's really, I mean, I kind of thought that she was like kidding with me. And then over the years, John worked with Tracy. I've run into her. Melanie Linsky, my daughter-in-law, has worked. And they all tell them, oh, Amy's accent. <laughs> and then I ran into her walking across the street in West Hollywood. And I'm like, huh, we hugged. She's a widow now. Oh, really? I yeah. didn't know that. And so we hugged and we talked about how much we love Melanie and my granddaughter, also who she met. And um, she brought up the accent thing again. I'm like, Tracy, I can't even like take that in. She, and she was like, no, you're real good. I'm like, oh, so maybe I can just do voiceovers. I don't care. One, uh, one day she made the announcements, uh, read the announcements at the Emmy Award uh, nominations, uh -huh. and she did it as Judy Andrews, oh. and it was so funny. Uh, and then another time I was with Debbie Reynolds. I, I hosted a night of, with Debbie Reynolds at my college, Columbia College in Chicago. Oh my God. And she liked my last name, Kometko. Yeah. So she kept doing like. I did too. I keep saying an it. An Eastern Kometko. European accent. Kometko. 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 Yeah. It does so. lend itself to exactly Mr. Kometko. It yes, May it I does. talk to you it for really, a moment? <laughs> you sound like all my relatives. There you go. Do they speak like this? <laughs> Some of them did. That's fantastic. Yeah. Debbie Reynolds played my mom on Wings. Oh, she was wonderful. Crystal and my mom. It was crazy because she had a woman that worked with her that did everything except for show night. She came in, she was like her her stand-in, but she, and she was great, and she was wearing one of the, you know how Debbie Reynolds had their, like her own wig right. line? She So she kind of looked like her, so she liked her. And then Debbie, Debbie, came in and watched and just came in and just like did it. It's crazy. Yeah. I love it. And Rip Taylor came the night of that she did the show and started throwing shit around. It was awesome. That would be fun to it watch. Was, Oh God, yeah, Wings was great. Maybe I should say my my greatest acting fun was because this is true. Working with Steve Weber, that couple, that weird hate sexing weird couple that we played, was out of this world fun. It was. It was a good show. I liked that show a lot. Uh, I forgot you were in Pretty Woman. Yes. The Mask. Yes. And of course, Wings, you just mentioned. Yes. Why did you say that about Pretty Woman? Because I forgot? No, because it's a little part, but it was super, super duper fun. And I got to work with Jason Alexander, which we keep running into each other and doing little things together. But that was so, so, so much fun. And director Gary Marshall was a hoot in his own right. I loved, I loved Gary. <laughs> he can't help it, right? He would get an egg salad or a tuna salad sandwich every day on the set. And he would eat, and he talked so slow. I freaking loved him. And he let Jason, uh, Alexander, and 
me, which is correct English, sounds wrong, but it's right, Jason and me, improvise a little bit. And we did. And there was one thing we were supposed to be at the very beginning uh, at the uh, polo game. We're supposed to be getting out of our DeLorean. And I had never been in a DeLorean before, uh, duh. And so the like the arm the wings of it opened the up, wing, yeah. and then I didn't realize that it would just go. Eh, so I slammed it down, and the window shattered. <laughs> and we kept going, but you could see people just like, and the car wrangler and the team, so they were all like <laughs> freaking out. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I broke a really expensive thing with my acting energy. Oh well, let me ask you, um, what is it you remember most from, say, Pretty Woman? was Julia Roberts, that was the first time I interviewed her. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember I went to a screening, an early screening of the oh, film. You did? Yeah. Before, when it was 3000, before they cut they it? Didn't have a, they didn't have a title for it, but I went to the, it was in the valley somewhere at a theater, and I was invited to see it because they wanted me to interview Julia the next day yeah, if yeah. I liked the movie. Oh, cool. And I went in there, and there was a row, they, they seated me, and there was a row in front of me that was empty, empty. Just before the movie started, in walks, uh, Michael Eisner, oh. Jeffrey Katzenberg, oh boy. all the suits. And I thought, oh, this must be a big deal. Yeah. And then, of course, she came on screen and all she had to do was smile. And she's, yeah. Yeah, and she lights it up. She does. She's um, a fantastic actress. She's, I mean, Pretty Woman was, was great and she was great in it. But the work she has done since then, did you, did you see her playing Martha Mitchell? Yes, I did. Come <laughs> on! <laughs> Who it's knew? My, it's my favorite role of hers ever. She was so s sunken down into that somehow. Doesn't look anything like Martha. Doesn't any, I mean, they didn't need to. She like embodied that, was very impressed. And she has a new movie, it? or it's on Netflix. Yeah, what is that? It looks scary. Wait, That's it's like end of the world something something. Yeah. That's the news. Yeah. I that's, think she can do just about anything. That's CNN. I'm scared to watch it. <laughs> we'll be back in a moment. Oh, my God. Really? And I have had a, a crush on her. 100% sexiest woman. What about Mel Brooks? Adore him. Adore everything about him. I feel like I never actually, when I would rap, they'd go, okay, you're rapped. I'm like... Like, we're going to need to, like, you know, I was going to say wash your chastity belt, not that. We're going to need to steam your robe. You need to get out of wardrobe. I'm like, oh, okay. So I'd run and just go back into my jeans and then just go sit back on the set. How, how would I not? How would I not? And it was so, it was so much fun, not just because he would, like, then in between be Mel Brooks. He was Mel Brooks all the way through it when he was in character, but also... I could ask him a little something. And Carl Reiner was shooting on the lot, the Formosa lot is where it was, Warner Brothers Formosa. And he was shooting, it was a like fatal attraction, something, something else put together kind of spoof. I can't remember what it was. I can't remember the name of it. But so every once in a while, you'd come back from lunch and there's Mel Brooks and Carl Reiner just in director's chairs talking and then Carrie Elwes, Richard Reese, like all of us, Megan Cavanaugh, we would just like sit at their feet and listen and, and hope that lunch would never be over. Because there, there's nothing like that. That's like the, the inventors of Comedy. TV and showbiz. Yeah. Uh, Carl Reiner was a nice guy. That's sweet. Rob Reiner's a nice guy too. Very sweet. And Estelle, they were great people. Uh, I saw Mel on uh, The Tonight Show once. He was telling a story. He can, he's a raconteur, raconteur. Yeah. And he's a he rockin' raconteur. A rockin' raconteur. Yeah. He was telling a story about uh, having to dispose of his uncle's ashes. And he, he, yeah, he did it uh, on the Hudson River in New York, I believe. And uh, he threw it into the air and it came back all over him. It's a very funny story the way he told it. But um, did, did Anne Bancroft ever visit the set? Oh, my God. Really? And I have had a, a crush on her. And I don't like when you go, a girl crush, a boy crush, crush. I didn't like the first time I saw her, I, you know, probably six years old. I was just like, what's happening? And I've always loved her, always thought she was 100% sexiest woman to walk the voice, face, everything, no matter what. And a little intimidating. 
a little intimidating, a little intimidating, a little intimidating. And so um, when she came to the set, and it was a thing, when I, I made Marion had to ride a horse. I'm like, I know how to ride a horse. I'm like, it's sat, side saddle, and you'll be wearing a chastity belt. I'm like, it's a what and a huh? So it was, I felt so dorky because they'd have to kind of like hoist me on it. And I was like, clinkity, I was just, you know, and when you went around, I was like, and she was so sweet. And she was like, mm. I just saw her there. And then afterwards, I, I went over and started to speak to her. And, and Mel said, hold on, did you just genuflect to my wife? And I said, yeah. And I said, he's like, but not just like, it wasn't a curtsy. It was like you were in the, at a cathedral. I'm like, I don't know. I was like, nice to meet you. I adored her. She was very nice to me. And you always called her Ms. Bancroft. Oh, just... Not Anne. And it's natural. And I heard, and then I did a movie um, called Home for the Holidays uh, that Jodie Foster directed. And Anne Bancroft was in it. And I, w I didn't work with her, but I heard all the things of people just want, okay, Anne, uh, not Jodie, but like people like second AD or Anne, if you could move over here. And she would just look at Jody, and Jody would say, it's uh, Miss Bancroft. <laughs> you know what? Good for her. Yeah. What else? She earned it. She earned it just by being born with that punum. She was absolutely beautiful. Uh, I interviewed Betty Davis once, and she was <sighs> the same way. You said Miss Davis. You oh. didn't say Betty. People, hey, Betty. <laughs> somehow, when my mom had the first the first batch of kids all two years apart, and then I was 12 years after that, but they all lived in Detroit. They grew up in Detroit, and I grew up in Cincinnati, but it's, my mom at one point got her bangs cut like this, and she had kind of her hair like this. I don't know, I've got the Timothy Chalamet going, don't judge it, I'm trying to grow it out a little bit. But she had her bangs like this, and somebody like mistook her for Betty Davis. It happened once, but I think it made my mom's life she absolutely loved that, but she had that same, like, expression, like, looking through you. I'm like, please blink. But, yeah, I bet you had to call her Miss yeah. Miss Davis. Yeah, and uh, I don't know if she had a natural sense of humor. I think she did. Betty Davis. Yes, but the the line she gave me when I asked her about working with Lenny and Gish uh, was so good. I thought that must have been crafted ahead of time. And I, it was because she said. Miss Gish never should have left silent pictures. <gasps> Whoa! That was when they were in the movie uh, Whales of August together. And I, okay. That's so mean. Oh, I isn't love it? it. That's like somebody, you say they have a face for radio. Yes. Yes. Or a voice for newspaper. Um, <laughs> a what? A voice for newspaper. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Um, you were on the set of The Mask, right? When Jim Carrey and Cameron Diaz became kind of a thing? I w yeah, I mean, I, I, I worked on the show. Director was brutal. Not go, sorry, Chuck Russell. I was, he was, I don't know. He, he didn't go for me at all. He cast me, and then he was just like, ugh. <laughs> like, stop, he's like, stop talking to the extras and concentrate. I'm like, but they're my friends. <laughs> Apparently, my, my work ethic, which was much like John's, which was like, just everybody's everybody. He didn't go for that. But anyway, Chuck... Um, Cameron is another, just like the sweetest she could be. And I loved her. I didn't know that she and Jim were whatever. So they were a couple, I mean, I, I knew it after that, but certainly didn't get in the way. Jim's wonderful. Have you ever interviewed him? Yes, I have. And I, he, and he I darling? think he was a little nervous and, uh, earlier, it was earlier in his career, Yeah, yeah. but then he loosened up and he, you know, he Absolutely. became Jim Carrey yes. and he was just great. There was a movie, I can't remember, it was a long time, a long, long time ago before Jim was Jim, called The Whoopie Boys. And they kept interviewing all, the, I mean, they kept, um, trying to like cast it and they had like different combinations of people and I remember... I met Jim at something where they were like matching people. Neither one of us got it, I believe. Uh, matching people up. And so I spent like a whole day with him and got to watch him just be himself and then be able to like, John was a big admirer of his. And those two I did introduce at a St. Jude uh, fundraiser. And just to see John and Jim Carrey talking to each other and Jim would say something and John's head would like throw back and John would say something and Jim would laugh and everybody was just like, watching them like oh, this is interesting to see two 
unbelievably natural and talented physical comedians talking to each other. It was great. What artist that you worked with stands out in your mind? Stands out in my mind? Well, besides John? Yeah. Um, what? Um, I mean, honestly, Steve Weber. And I worked with him on a, uh, with Mel Brooks, too. He's a genuinely nice guy. Genuinely talented as F guy. Ridiculous. And he's somebody that, for me, you can just, in between takes or in between scenes, just like be a regular person and he could be teasing me or, or whatever. And then da 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 action and we go right back to where we were before and i like that that's easier than me than just like staying in character and thinking about my lines because if i do that i overthink everything don't talk to me i'm in character yeah please don't talk. please get out of my eyeline <laughs> but wait there's more we'll be right back i have set myself up for better or worse to talk about john every day. Let me ask about John, if you don't mind. I love it. Okay. Uh, and you interviewed him a lot? Uh, several times, yes. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how's life been? It's been 20 years. Do you get tired of people asking you about John? Well, I have set myself up, for better or worse, to talk about John every day, for better or for worse. I think I remember that from the wedding, um, because I've started a foundation. 20 years ago, right after he died, in his name, dedicated to his legacy, but so other families don't have to suffer through the absolute cluster F of someone being misdiagnosed and dying from an aortic dissection. So I thought, what can I do as one person in John's name? And so I started this foundation, and I just very grassroots at the beginning, and Never let, never lost that grassroots feeling. There's people you can talk to when you, if something happens and your family suffers a, an aortic dissection, somebody in your family, or you find out somehow you're at risk for it, very often genetic, you can literally, we have <laughs> created this group of people, trained them up, who are called aortic advocates. And so it's peer to peer, because you can get all the information from your doctor, and if you don't, please see me, because I will tell your doctor where to look for it. <sighs> but um, just creating a community of, of people who understand how it like shakes up your life and then puts it down and like, and now it's Christmas. And you're like, wait, what's happening? You know, mm -hmm. so to be able to share and to learn from people, because sadly, with this, this disease, the thoracic aortic aneurysm and dissection, there's a lot of grief and sadness that comes. Because it's sudden. Because the tear, the tear inside your aorta that starts effing you up and the blood is going in the wrong place is sudden. The aneurysm that happens before it can grow for years, so you can see it. Mm -hmm. But if you don't know you're at risk for it, genetically, or then, um, then it feels like it just, they call it a ticking time bomb. And I'm like, uh-huh. I've seen MacGyver. You don't have to blow up. You can figure it out. And so that's, we help families and doctors and surgeons figure it out. Not that we do what doctors do, not that we do what surgeons do, but for them to be able to talk to the family, to the person and the rest of the family and be able to say, hey, remember John Ritter? Come and knock on this door. It's called the John Ritter Foundation. And there's community, there's information, there's humor when there needs to be. And so in John's name, I've been doing that for 20 years. So do I talk about John every day? Do I think about him every day? Yes, I would anyway. And do I feel like he's always with me? Yes, in the way that I feel like my parents are who passed away when I was young. It's you kind of, you know, you kind of absorb them. And there's probably and carry other people with who, you. Yeah, and carry them with you. Right. How would you And if sometimes you, you go, Don't look, I'm gonna do this thing. <laughs> <laughs> if yeah. Um, Whatever. Or uh, yeah, I'll say in my head, I don't know. 
I hope they're not watching. I hope right they're not now. watching this. Or, <laughs> did you know that was possible? <laughs> <laughs> I'm an adult now. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, how would you describe an aortic dissection to someone in a nutshell? If you if you met a, a, an average person on the street, how would you? What would you say to them about? I think first people need to know what an aorta is, because I didn't. I mean, I probably learned it in whenever you get that, you know, biology or an anatomy book, and then you go, ah, but it's as as important as everything else in your body, more important than most things. You can't live without it because your heart is doing the pumping of the blood that goes and feeds your brain, your body, feeds it oxygen, actually. That's what people forget. That's what happens. But the, play, the way that it feeds that to your body is through this candy cane shaped vessel, right? Biggest artery in your body. And the surgeons, some of them are very romantic about it. God bless them that have, they call it the tree of life of your body because that's what it does. It feeds or the river Nile, do you know? And so it, it's not part of your heart. It starts at the uh, aortic valve, which usually has three leaflets that just keeps the blood going this way, this way, not back in. So this part of it's called ascending, which makes sense. This part is the arch and then descending. So it's broken up, not biologically, but for the doctors into those three parts. An aneurysm is a ballooning of that. In any area of that is bad, obviously, because something's gonna happen. And what often happens is the three layers that it's made out of, that redundancy, that's put into like Henry Ford would do if he was creating a, a, an aorta to make to nothing slips through. If it gets a little tear on the inside layer, then the blood, which is being pumped at an enormous rate, imagine blood from here is being to go to your whole body. It starts going a little bit inside of that tear and starts ripping inside the lining. And for people in Chicago and Ohio and New York who have, are the baby of their family and got a hand-me-down um, winter coat. I said this one time and half the people in the audience went, what? And the other one's like, oh yeah. It's like, you put your arm in the sleeve the first time and it doesn't come out the sleeve because it's gone inside the, the line, lining, right? Yes. Do you know what I'm talking yep. about, right? That, yep. that, that thing from where? And so if the blood, part of it is going where it needs to be, but the other part is actually from the blood pressure being pumped, more and more ripping down inside. So there's this tributary. The main, the main freeway is called the lumen, true lumen, which just means a big hole. And then the false lumen starts invading. So if you would do a cross section, it would look, instead of like this, it would start to look like a double barrel shotgun. And one of those places that it's going is just pooling inside. Very, very dangerous. The aneurysm happens in most cases, probably 90% of the cases in aneurysm first, which you can see on a CAT scan. If you go into a hospital with chest pain, it would behoove everyone, if they know they have family history or not. If they have family history with aortic dissection, you say, uh, I have family history of aortic dissection. And feel free to just say you're related to John, I don't care. It's like, check me for that. If you can't remember what it's called, check me for the John Ritter thing. But they should do a CT scan because then that rules out it's a heart attack because sadly, and we talked about this, if you, if you treat for a, a heart attack, it's not the heart that's failing and it's not a block, it's a tear. So you're doing everything wrong. Blood, all the stuff they did to John, blood thinners and all that. And he was dying from a tear in his aorta. It happens a lot. If I'm not mistaken, I think Lucille Ball had an aortic. I think that's what she died from. She did die from that. She did. And also George C. Scott. And the other thing is, we don't know how many people died from it. Because Tex Ritter, John's dad, right. for sure died from that. And we know because, first of all, his mom lived to be 97 or something. But John's brother, I don't mean Texas mom, I mean John's mom, Texas wife, Dorothy Ritter, but John's brother, Tom, so John died in 2003. In 2007, Tom had a TIA, a mini stroke, and they treat it the way they treat it. But I just said, Tom hasn't had his yearly echo because everybody gets their yearly echoes that's related because there's the 
Another thing besides the John Ritter uh, Foundation is the John Ritter Research Program in Aortic and Vascular Diseases at University of Texas. This is a genetic research program that had about one and a couple in the hopper when John passed away of genes that were identified for this. And now there are dozens and dozens and dozens on the way because of the way AI properly, you know, the, the thing we like about AI is that we can reproduce effects without having, you know, do the math without having all of the families, but we still do need families for it. So Tommy Ritter, when they did do his scan, had an aneurysm, same place as John's, that ascending that I was talking about, which is very dangerous because it can pull your, pull the three leaflets of your um, aortic valve out of shape. And so it can't do what it can do for, for all kinds of reasons it is. Okay. Um, but, but Tom got fixed. Tom had his aortic arch replaced. So John's brother lives because he knew what to look for. I think if there's ever a category about this on Jeopardy, you'd do really well. I would do well on Jeopardy anyway. Oh, okay. You have no idea. Call me. Just no math. I don't know what would have happened. I don't know what would have happened with the foundation because for a while it was just me. I would call it a, the uh, the mom and pop shop, no pop. And for years, I mean, we only got a, and we were doing stuff and changing and just, I would, here I am from Cincinnati, college in Detroit, didn't finish. Here I am speaking at Yale, at the Mayo Clinic and like in front of all these surgeons because Part of the key is what do people need to know? Actual people. And surgeons are wonderful, most of them. Wonderful, but a lot of times they have it, the aortic dissection just as, a, as an emergency. So by the time the surgeon sees somebody, they are to use from a different specialty. They're already up on blocks with the hood open. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I've enjoyed this. Are we done? I think so. Let's do it over a cup of whatever sometime. Okay. Ayahuasca. <laughs> I don't drink, so it has yeah. to be something. Oh, you know what? Non-potent. Me neither. But uh, today's my eighth year anniversary. You're kidding! No. I should have brought a cake. I love it. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks. I. I didn't think I'd make it. There were times when I thought I wouldn't make of it. Of course, that's what makes it all so freaking sweet. It only took three times in rehab. <laughs> but do you know what? So it does, it does. It's, n oh my God. I'm so very, very happy for you. Thanks. I am I too. It, it I, makes never, such a difference. I'm very lucky because it's in my family. My grandfather, you know, probably drank himself to death. Yeah, we had a bunch happens. of them in my family too. Yeah, well, I'm Irish. Sorry. Uh -oh. But so it was kind of inevitable. Sorry, Irish people. Still Here Hollywood is a production of the Still Here Network. All Things Technical, run by Justin Zangerly. Theme music by Brian Sanishin. And executive producer is Jim Lichtenstein.